But I'm excited uh, this morning uh, for uh, the continuation of a series that you guys have called uh, You Asked For. And this series is all about helping bring about clarity to the questions that you guys have answered or have as a church in regards to your faith and your walk with Jesus. And my Lord, the questions that you have asked. I I was looking at uh, just some of the messages over the past uh, three weeks since you guys started this series. And if you're a newcomer, you're probably like, This church is not holding back. You covered church abuse, heaven and hell, spiritual warfare. And it's like, man, what a lineup of topics right there. It's like (laughs) you're coming to the first time you're like, hmm. Yeah, we learned about spiritual warfare today. It's like, great, great. But, uh, but I love it. I love that uh, you have pastors and leadership that want to help you in your walk, in your faith, and be able to help answer those questions to minimize, uh, to minimize any gray areas that you may have. And we're going to continue. Uh, and a question that was asked, and the question that we're tackling today is this, how can we tell a difference between a faith that is based solely around tradition rather than the truth within scripture? How can we tell the difference between a faith that's based solely around tradition rather than the truth within scripture? And now there's so many people in here, you're you're coming from different contexts. Some of you have maybe been in church your whole life. And so when you hear tradition, you're hearing just kind of the practices and formations that you have been passed down to you, whether from your denomination, whether from family. And then there's some of you in here, you're maybe new to the faith. And the tradition that you have is kind of based around the truth that you've been following, maybe up until meeting Jesus or still working on molding your lives around Jesus. And so we're going to dive into this question today. And as we're diving into this question, I want to remind you of a promise and a statement that Jesus gave that John recorded in his gospel in John chapter 10, verse 10. And it says this, that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and life to the fullest. And I want to, as we're going through that, I want us to have that in the back of our minds. As we're answering this question, it's because we're trying to get closer to experiencing the promise that Jesus has given us. Amen. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's pray. Let's get our hearts, uh, continue to be ready and we'll dive in this morning. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we are thankful just for the opportunity we have just to gather together as a community, uh, to grow closer to you, Lord. Lord, I'm praying that there would just be hearts that are ready to hear, uh, your truth, Lord as we open up your word, because it's no, this isn't just some fancy TED talk, but Lord, this is truth that we're discussing that is found within your scriptures, the truth of who you are. And so Lord, I'm praying that uh, we would be ready to listen to that truth, Lord. And Lord, even as you're, com- as I'm communicating today, I'm praying that hearts would be open and ready to receive. And even you start working on the hearts uh, as I'm communicating this morning. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this. So we have Thanksgiving coming up. How many of you guys, that's your favorite holiday because, you know, you get food, right? All right. Uh, we have Christmas coming up, but uh, I want to, let me, I'm going to take a quick survey. So who in here is the person that you're, you're the family that hosts everybody. Like everybody comes to your house, right? Anybody? Okay. Like that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. If you're, if you're the husband and you're, you're probably like, that is the worst type of, you know, time. This is the worst time of the year because what does that mean? You are cleaning everything. Like everything has to be clean. Every room. It's like, they're not even going to be in this room. I don't care. It needs to look this. It needs to look like this. Um, and I've been married, uh, coming up on three months to my wife, Annabelle, and just in our time of gathering, uh, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, three months y'all. Yeah, usually you get applauded for like 45 years, y'all are like three months. This is great. This is, this is a great sign for the rest of our time together. Um, but, you know, I, I, my, my wife just being married just for only three months, we started hosting at our home just uh, some of uh, a small group that we lead. And man, even just the cleaning we have to do for that. You know, I'm like, man, this looks good. And it's like, okay, let's start. Let's start like, you know, let's, this needs to be mopped again or something like that. Um, yeah, not my, uh, not my favorite, but, uh, but you have the people that host and who are maybe the travelers? Like, you're like, man, I do not take on that burden, but instead I unwillingly go to my in-laws. Uh, you know, maybe, no, I'm just kidding. Love God, love people. Come on, y'all. Uh, but 
No, you, you have the travelers. And uh, growing up, I was, my family were the travelers. We didn't really host. So, uh, for example, for Christmas, on Christmas Eve, we would go to my mom's side of the family. And then on Christmas Day, we would go to my dad's side of the family. And there's different traditions that we all have when it comes to the different holidays, such as Thanksgiving, uh, when we celebrate Christmas, maybe even birthdays. But there's a particular tradition that always frustrated me when we would go to my mom's mom, my Grammy. That's how she spelled in my phone. But we would go to her house and after dinner, we all eat together. And after that, we would proceed to go and take pictures. Now, let's bring clarity to this. This is not a quick selfie moment. Okay, we have all the family. We got the cousins, you know, my aunts, my uncles are there. And so this is not just a man, quick selfie, everybody. Oh, great time. Awesome. No, my Grammy, she's not posting on her Instagram stories. Like it's not, she doesn't recognize like this will show up in a memory next year. Like that's what it, no, she, she wants to take pictures and this is not just, all right, everybody come together. No, it's like, okay, grandkids. All right, and you know, and we'll take a picture together and she'll see one of the cousins not smiling, great. And she's like, hey, 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 fix your smile, come on. (laughs) You know, and then we go back and then after that, she's like, okay, now I need to get a picture with my kids. And so she gets with all of her kids and it's like, okay, oh, 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 no, chin down, chin down this way. Like, and so this would, would take like a, maybe a two minute process. I'm telling you people that it was 30 minutes. Like after dinner, we're just sitting there and you know, Grammy's just putting us in position. She's like, okay, sit here. Smile, get up, you know, and then come back and just like all the different arrangements to get with the family. But it was so frustrating because I'm like, come on, please, please. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. But what this tradition, as I've uh, gotten older, I've recognized that this tradition revealed a value that my Grammy had. And what the value that my Grammy has was that she loved her family, that she valued her family. And the reason why She took all these pictures to every single time we would gather, whether it's Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthday, is because it was out of a love for the core value, which is her family that she wants to go back and reflect upon, right? And so the tradition of that did not inform her values, but her values informed her tradition, See, when it comes to the biblical truth within the scriptures and how we implement traditions surrounding the truth, biblical truth is what should inspire us to implement traditions that reflect that truth. Biblical truth. What is biblical truth? We were all sinners. But yet Jesus came down, died on the cross, took all of the sin and pain we would ever endure, past, present, and future on the cross, and he would die for us. The great thing about it is that he did not stay dead, but it was recorded that on the third day he resurrected. Many witnesses saw the resurrection, uh, him being alive. And as a result of that, he ascended back up to heaven, promising that he would send down his spirit and anyone that surrenders to him gets to have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them and gets to have a relationship with the living God. And that is biblical truth. And kind of looking at tradition, tradition is often a series of patterns or rhythms or practices that we have implemented either generation to generation, or maybe we've implemented uh, just from what we have experienced uh, growing up, whether it's through a different denomination, whether it's through uh, maybe what grandpa told you, maybe just your life experience or context. But these practices sometimes may become idols that we hold on to. They may become traditions might fall in the vein of that we hold to be truth. And, and here's what I'm saying. Truth, if we just describe biblical truth, biblical truth needs to be up here and traditions need to be able to come under the practices, the implementations, the rhythms need to flow from biblical truth instead of tradition Our practices, our ways that we, our life experiences, what we've been taught generation to generation, and then mold a truth that fits our rhythm of life. Are y'all following me so far? So I want to kind of uh, go into answering this question uh, this morning and uh, this sub question here we'll answer in just a moment, but it's how do we make sure that biblical truth informs tradition? 
How do we make sure? We all have traditions, whether it's within our faith, whether it's in how we do certain things within life. Some of us going to church on Sunday is a tradition, but some of us are here and we're just like, I was just told this is what I was supposed to do. All right. So you're here. You're like, all right, love God. Here I am, right? Or maybe like, you know, you're, you're, the, you're the family. You pray before every meal and you're like, bless this food. Let it be a nourishment to our body. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all know that prayer. Y'all talking about, yeah, that's, that's called the quick, efficient, you know, in our minds, it's heartfelt prayer, right? This is something we just do, right? But we've implemented maybe some routines and patterns that are under the covering of traditions in our life that maybe have led us away from really understanding biblical truth, really understanding the beauty that comes with knowing who Jesus is. And if we're not careful, traditions without biblical truth can paralyze us when biblical truth is meant to free us. Traditions keep you in alignment with your ways, your thoughts without biblical truth. Biblical truth gives me the freedom to experience what Jesus promised, that life and life to the fullest. Tradition, without the understanding of biblical truth, leads to a passive disciple of Christ. Tradition, without the understanding of biblical truth, leads to a passive disciple of Christ. Can I tell you, tradition should be formed out of our response to the biblical truth that we just heard. And the title of my message, if you're taking notes tonight, is, or this morning, Truth Informs Tradition. Truth Informs Tradition. And we're going to look at a conversation that Jesus has when he was here on the earth with the people in the day called the Pharisees. And he has this kind of dialogue that, you know, progressively just starts like getting crazy. And we're going to look at that passage and stay there for the remainder of our time together. And it's Matthew chapter 15, verse 1 going all the way through verse nine. And it says this, then some Pharisees and teacher of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. I know some of y'all are highlighting that to share with your kids after this. Here we go. Continuing in verse five, you were like, mm, that's good. That's good. That's your takeaway. Verse five, but you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. What are we seeing taking place here? Jesus is calling out what is known as oral law. So up until this point, there is the written law, what God gave Moses for them to follow, right? Up until this point. And then there is oral law, which was, we see here, the elders was developed to be able to help people stay in alignment with the written law. But what has happened here as we're seeing this conversation, which first off, this conversation is happening because the Pharisees are mad that Peter didn't wash his hands. All right? Like, y'all know some of y'all be getting on your kids like that, right? You're like, what are you doing? Right? This is how the conversation is going. But Jesus is going into this conversation where basically showing them that, hey, you have started to develop a bigger love for oral law that was passed down from man, that was developed by man, instead of holding true to the written law of God. How do we make sure that biblical truth informs tradition so that we might be able to experience the promise that Jesus gave us of having life and life to the fullest. And I want to give you just a couple thoughts. And the first one is this. You have to love God more than anything or anyone. Love God more than anything or anyone. Uh, I moved uh, here to Oklahoma from North Carolina back in May of 2019. I did not know anyone. It was just through random connections that uh, one of the people that were one of my leaders where I was at, she was in my uh, lead pastor student ministry in Duncan, Oklahoma. 
years ago. So got connected, came out here, long story short, love the people, love my church, love my pastors, um, and mo- made the move. Did not know anybody. There was no family out here. Like literally I was making friends with just the people who were serving me at the restaurant. Anybody just go to the restaurant by yourself and you're like, hmm, this is different. But you know, as long as there's a TV, it makes it less awkward. And so I was, I mean, for real, y'all, I was literally, I, I said, I, I told my server, I was like, hey, dude, uh, uh, I know we don't know each other, but want to hang out? You know, I'm new to the area and yeah, so we hung out. His name's Diego. (laughs) But, you know, uh, but what I found myself as a result of not having many friends and not having family, I started to, and this is like, this was, I was just out of uh, college and finished with my bachelor's degree, moved here. I'm excited to be able to do ministry full time instead of just part time while I was still doing school. And I had this zeal for ministry and I found myself, man, I was like, okay, I came to the youth ministry as less than 15 students. And I'm like, okay, it's time to get to work. And so I was starting to focus on systems, processes, started to think on events and all these different things. And what I started to find was that my work week going from five days started shifting into six days. And then from six days, it started shifting into seven days. And I found myself getting consumed with doing ministry things. And how many of you know, it's not like that is a bad thing, but it started to become unhealthy. And I started uh, getting consumed with it. And I remember my pastor, he took me to a big truck tacos. Anybody ever been there in the city? Big truck? Yeah, great. The fried shrimp tacos, amazing. Highly recommend it. Uh, Anyway, besides the point. But I remember sitting down and my pastor, he was telling me, he's like, hey, I've noticed your uh, vehicle here at the church a lot. Like days you shouldn't have to be here. And I remember him just telling me to slow down. And after just that conversation, I started reflecting and I just came to, I came to the conclusion and I feel like just the Holy Spirit revealed, I started idolizing ministry. And it started rivaling my love for God because I was starting to develop a higher love for just the act of ministry, which on the outside, we would say, okay, the youth group, it was growing. Like I started like starting to see the fruit of my labor, but it was at the cost of damaging my soul. Right. And this is where we pick up with the conversation that Jesus is having with the Pharisees. He says, why do your disciples, this is, or the Pharisees say this, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? What has happened is that the Pharisees have started idolizing the tradition of the elders. Man-made tradition. They started idolizing it and started forgetting about the law that was written, not by man, but by who? God. And and this is so important because they started to build uh, this idolatry, this this idolatry mindset of the tradition of the elders that started them to miss out on truth that was found within the commands that God had given them. And I think some of us, maybe have just some of our life experiences and context from where we've came from, we can maybe idolize something, a practice that was passed down from a family member, right? We can idolize a a practice or tradition that was found with maybe in our denomination that we grew up under. And whatever it may be, we can find ourselves sometimes holding so tight to a practice or a rhythm that we have established that we have implemented, whether it's day after day, week, to, week after week, month after month, year after year, that we can miss out and start, and it can start to rival your relationship with God. It can start to rival truth. And this is what we need to be careful of because see, my ability to live out tradition within biblical truth must Come with me, have an, a deep connection to loving God over anyone and everything else. My ability to live out tradition within biblical truth must, firm with, uh, must first come with me having a deep connection to loving God over anyone and everything else. Jesus later on would say to fulfill the law of the prophets and of Moses. He says this in Matthew 22, verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. I'm newly married. 
But my wife and I have an understanding. I love God more than I love her. And she loves God more than she loves me. And I, we, we hear that and it's kind of like, that's kind of off-putting to say, right? Because we're used to usually saying like, you know, your husband, or my wife's my rock. This, that, and the other. These are statements that we say with good intentions. But I have to understand, in order for me to be able to start having more of a healthy marriage as we have ventured on to being married, I have to keep God on the throne of my life. Because out of God being on the throne, then the fruits of that is a healthy marriage. Does that make sense? See, God has to be on the throne. Loving God over everything and anyone else allows me to be able to obey the commands that God has given me. See, if biblical truth comes from God, then my love for God is what I should center my practices that are within my tradition around. Does that make sense? So if I truly love God, then it's not my traditions over here and then where I and put God under my traditions. But if I really love God I, and the truth of who he is, then it's biblical truth. My love for God and everything else must come under the covering of that. And if it's not going to fit un, un, under the covering, then I need to evaluate, man, I probably need to let go of this. I probably need to reframe work my ideology on certain things. I probably need to reframework how I'm living my life right now so that I can live the life that Jesus called me and experience life and life to the fullest. I must love God more than anything or anyone. Truth informs tradition. How do we make sure that truth informs tradition? Second thought is this. Expect God to move within the context of his character and not your preferences. Expect God to move within the context of his character and not your preferences. We continue reading in verse 4. Jesus says, For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been blessed, been used to help their father or mother, is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. See here, Jesus calling out, God says this. God says this, but you say this. He's pointing out that you have become separate from what God has originally stated. And I know some of you are probably like, why is he throwing in people's mom and dads in here, right? Like, it's just random. Like, we're going from like, washing, like them being upset, the Pharisees being upset with uh, Peter not washing his hands, right? And we go into Jesus talking about, man, you're breaking one of the Ten Commandments. And what this meant, so when the Ten Commandments were giving, uh, given, honor your father wasn't just meant for just the respect, right? What it meant in that culture, well, honoring your father and mother means that you took care of them and helped provided for them when they were not able to go and do manual labor or whatever labor, uh, to be able to support themselves. So you would go and and help financially take care of them so that they could be like, okay, and they would be set. Now, what has happened out of oral law by man, they said, well, actually, you don't have to do that. Instead of giving your finances to be able to, part of your finances to give and be able to take care of your parents, instead, you can use that and give it to the temple and say it's given to God, right? So they manipulated it to be able to fit their preferences because who does that benefit? The religious leaders, the Pharisees. And so Jesus is going in because they have essentially replaced the law of God with their own law that fits their preferences. See, their traditions started to mold what they held as truth instead of truth starting to mold their traditions, See, remember that as followers of Jesus, we are called to mold ourselves to be more like Jesus, not have Jesus to be more like us. I'm the first to admit I am a sinner. I don't know everything. I make mistakes. That is why I need a savior that can save me and someone that I can model my life after so, after so I can be more holy like he is holy. Y'all follow me? See, it's about us molding ourselves to Jesus and not having ourselves 
uh, or not having Jesus mold himself to us. See, Ephesians 5.1, Paul writes to the church of Ephesus and he says this and he says in five, uh, Ephesians 5.1, he says, but be imitators of God, be imitators of God. Can I tell you, just because the truth is hard, it doesn't mean we get to rework it so it fits us better. I get it. Listen, y'all, following God is is tough. It's not always easy. Sometimes it is easy to just cave into our sinful nature. I get it. But can I tell you, just because it's tough doesn't mean that we shouldn't follow. Just because the things of life come at us where it makes it easy for us to, man, avoid truth, take a step away from it, man, it doesn't mean that truth is still not truth. See, the truth may be hard. Following God's command, his word may be hard, but can I tell you, at least it's consistent. The author of Hebrews 13, 8 says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and what? forever. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Can I tell you, there is no evolving truth. There is only one truth. Jesus reminds us in John's gospel in chapter 14, verse 6, that he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Expect God to move within the context of his character and not our preferences. Truth informs our traditions. How do we make sure that truth continues to inform our traditions? And the third thought is this. Remember the filter, or excuse me, remove the filters that have stopped God from fully having your heart. Remove the filters that have stopped God from fully having your heart. We continue reading in this conversation. Jesus says, you hypocrites. Woo. Saying this to the Pharisees. He says, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus calls them out. You know how to play the game. You know what the right words to say, but you are manipulating what was meant to be holy to fit you and what you want to practice. And he calls them out that saying, you know how to play the game. You have the knowledge of who God is, but your heart has not been fully captivated by him. Man, how many of us have maybe, we know, we know like, okay, I can quote to you the scripture. Okay, I can quote to you. Yeah, I'm supposed to do this, supposed to do that. But how many of us have maybe have not gave God our heart fully? In Matthew 5, 8 says this, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know what's crazy throughout this whole passage in the conversation? Because of the filters that the Pharisees had in their hearts of by trying to justify their traditions, they didn't recognize who was standing right in front of them. Because of their inability to remove the filters of their traditions, of the way they've just been taught and how they've always done it, and their inability to really understand truth, they forgot truth was looking them right in the face. They didn't recognize who was right in front of them. I love what Proverbs 3, 4 through 5 says. It says, trust in the Lord with all, uh, trust in the Lord and lean not on, on your own understanding, but instead acknowledge him, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Acknowledge who's right in front of you, Grace Fellowship Church. It is Jesus, the son of the living God. Truth is just not a concept of principles. It is a person. This is not a principle-driven scripture that we read. It's a book that we read that draws us to the truth of who a person is. That person is Jesus. So maybe we need to ask ourselves, what are some filters that have stopped me from God truly having my heart? 
Because when I remove the filters that have stopped God from truly having my heart, then Sunday morning gatherings and experiences become a lot more powerful. Because it's no longer about what worship sounds like. It's no longer about who communicates. But we walk into an expectation that I get to worship. I get to experience a holy moment of engaging with the God of the universe, the God who created me, the God who sees me, who hears me, who loves me. I get to engage in that moment. When you're reading the scriptures and when somebody's preaching, it's not about who's preaching. It's about you get to engage in the scriptures, that you get to engage with truth. And knowing that truth leads you to a person named Jesus, can I ask you this? How much more could God use you in your workplace? How much more could God use you as parents as, uh, that you have been called to steward over your kids? How much more could God use you if you remove the filters of just what you have learned from your past and just what tradition has been taught to you by either mom or dad growing up or by grandparents or just who you've seen, uh, who you've seen in your life? What if we remove those filters and say, God, use me. God, you can have my heart. Because then the job that you don't really like that much you start walking in with the perspective of like, all right, God, you have placed me here. Who have you called me to reach here in this moment? Who have you called me? I don't like this job. I don't like it. Not a fan of the people. But I recognize that the commandments you have given me is to love you and to love your people. So can you help me utilize the opportunities that are within my context? Right? Right? How much more could God use you? Truth informs tradition. Truth informs tradition. We started out with a statement that tradition without the understanding of biblical truth leads to a passive disciple of Christ, a passive follower. But let's look at the flip side of that. Tradition met with the understanding of biblical truth leads to a passionate disciple of Christ, a passionate follower of Jesus. This leads me to experiencing what Jesus promised me in John 10, 10, that he's come to give me life and life to the fullest. When I start putting the practices in my life, the traditions that I maybe have held as this at a higher value than the truth of who Jesus is. When I start shifting my traditions to be under the truth of who God is, not, it will not make you passive. It will make you passionate. Because like I said, you will go into every op area that you are in, whether it's your workplace, whether it's in your family, and you're going to come in with the perspective like, God, how can you use me here? Let the truth that has shaped me be able to, continue to go throughout each context that I find myself in, each title as employee, as father, as husband, as mother, as wife. Let that shape how I live out the commands that you have given me, which is to love you and to love people. Truth informs tradition. Man, I don't know where most of you are, maybe some of you are hearing this and you're thinking of traditions through just what you grew up with right? And denominations and stuff when you think of the spiritual type of traditions. But maybe some of you, you're thinking of maybe practices that you have been, that you have implemented in your life that are not of Jesus, that are more in alignment with your sinful nature than who Jesus is. Can I tell you that there's a truth that you can hold on to, that you can rely on to, that is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you can align yourself under. Because here's the beauty in that. As we talk about how truth informs traditions, it will shape the way you live. Things will not become so much more mundane, but you will look at every opportunity as an impactful opportunity to love God and to love his people. So wherever you're at today, wherever you're at, we're just, I want to take just an opportunity for us just to be still. And really the practical application from this message is just for you to reflect. Where have my traditions 
become more important than the truth of who God is? Where have I tried to make God fit in with my preferences rather than me being molded to who he is and what he's called for me in my life? What are the filters that have stopped me from fully experiencing and knowing and understanding who God is? Because can I tell you right now, Grace, Grace Fellowship Church, that he's right here. Truth is in the room. His presence is in the room. Now it's on us to engage with it. So can we do this? Can we just bow our heads and close our eyes? And just take a moment to reflect on maybe just some of the practices that you have implemented in your life that maybe have not been based out of or founded within biblical truth. Truth of who Jesus is. Lord, I'm thankful for each and every person that's in the room this morning. I'm thankful that we are able to come with the understanding that truth should inform our traditions, that the truth of who you are is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. And yes, though, Lord, it may be hard. And yes, we have preferences and how we wish things would go and uh, how we wish to live life. But Lord, let us be able to draw to the deep conviction of loving you more than anything else in this life. Lord, let the result of us loving you more than anything help us to be better fathers. Help us to be uh, better mothers. Help us to be better employees, Lord. Not for the sake of just the titles, but because we want to be able to let the love that you have shown us flow through every title and every context that we find ourselves in. So Lord, would you lead us this morning? Help us to become more like you. Let the truth of who you are lead us to becoming closer to you every single day. We love you, King Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.